joined by a very distinguished panel of education experts, science journalists, and the Minister, the Right Honourable Nick Gibb, will be joining us remotely. Now, before we begin, and just to kick off this session, I'd like to paint you a picture. Imagine, if you will, that a senior politician is being interviewed on um, the 6 o'clock news, perhaps, or the Today programme. Maybe they have been having a difficult discussion with the unions, and then one of the, then the, the interviewer says, do you think the unions are a bit like Oliver Twist, always asking for more? And the minister looks baffled and sort of says, who's Oliver Twist? And when it's explained to him, sort of throws up his hands and said, well, you know, I never had a head for reading, at which point the journalist chuckles and said, yeah, he'd never seen the point in those book things anyway. I don't think that would be a career-enhancing moment for the minister concerned. And yet, conversations like this happen about maths every day, every week, at the dinner table, on TV, at conferences. It's not just acceptable to profess that you are bad at maths in British society. It's almost a badge of honour. And this is despite the fact that maths is one of the things which can make the biggest difference to both individual success at every level and also to our economic success as a nation. There is a stat that if you get maths A level, you will earn six to ten thousand pounds on average more in your in your career uh, per year. And that applies even if you do an arts degree and even if you go into a profession which appears to have nothing to do with maths, such as the power of maths in order to transform individuals' productivity. And of course, that's even without looking at the fact that so many of our high growth, high productivity sectors have maths at their foundation. Now, this government has done a tremendous amount for maths, from the times tables test at primary school to math schools at post 16, to the fact that maths A-level is now the most taken A-level, which it was not 20 years ago. But I think everyone would agree there is still more to do, both from helping people who need to have, get the basic grasp of numeracy to also to creating maths excellence for our very best mathematicians so that they can go on and really fulfil their potential. And that's what this panel will be discussing, both why maths is the key to Britain's prosperity and how we can achieve it particularly in light of our current Prime Minister's um, pledge that he wants all children to study maths to 18. So without further ado, I will bring in one of the people who has done the most for maths education in this country over the last 13 years, um, long-term schools minister, the Right Honourable Nick Gibb, MP, who will be joining us remotely. Thank you, and Ian, for that. And I'm sorry that it, it is remote. Um, my husband uh, had an accident running, and he's only just come out of surgery last week on his hip, and he needs somebody to help uh, live a life while, while he's in incapacitated. So I apologise for not being there. Ian, everything you say is right uh, about mathematics. In opposition, we were very worried. That's uh, between 2005 and 10 that this country was falling down the international league table of mathematics rankings. We were eighth in the year 2000, but by 2006, we were 24th, and then by 2009, we were 28th. And Michael Gove and I set out to find out why that was happening. What was the fundamental reason for that drop? And I think in any form formulation of policy, in, every, in whichever department that you're in, the, the, the thing you have to do first of all is find out the cause of the underperformance and the thing that you're trying to uh, address. When discussing maths 11 to 18, you have to really understand the disaster that was happening in primary school maths as a consequence of Labour's policy and the introduction of the numeracy strategies that were introduced in 1999. This strategy basically changed the way children were taught arithmetic. Uh, they, they used the, the, grid, the grid method uh, replaced long multiplication, the chunking method replaced long division, and the Dutch reform method, a horizontal approach to addition and subtraction, replaced columnar addition and subtraction. I can bore anybody to death in showing you those different approaches, um, and I won't do that now. But when I did show the Chinese, uh, the Shanghai Education Commission, this approach when they came over to England several years ago, they, they, were, they just laughed at this approach that we were using in our schools. 
And when I visited schools during those opposition years and looked at what, how children were being taught math, there was no traditional methods of long division or long multiplication and columnar method of addition and subtraction. I remember visiting a school in Chiswick. It was, I was sent there by officials to see the best maths that uh, they, there was. And I met the year six girl who was the best at maths in her class. And I asked her to do a sum, a, a calculation, which was 12 into 270. And she basically multiplied 12 by 10 and deducted 120 from 270, leaving 150, and then took another 10 times 12 from the 150, leaving 30. And then, then had the, the 2 times 12 is 24, and leaving 6, which is half of 12. And then she added up all those combinations of 10 and 10 and 2 and a half and came to the answer 22 and a half. But it took her over five minutes to do that calculation. And I was quite astonished to see that that was the written method being taught. No other country that I was aware of in the world was using that method. And, as you know, it's no wonder that uh, we were declining into the national tables. On the grid method, you take, through multiplying 27 by, one, uh, by 12 by 270, you se separate out the 2 and the 10 of 12 and the 200 and the 70. You put them into a grid and you multiply each of the combinations of numbers, and then you add it all up. Absolutely balmy. And, um, and the other thing I saw uh, in my visit as a, as a minister in, this, in that first year was long multiplication being taught in a different school. They, you, they were teaching the traditional algorithm, but they taught it in half a lesson. And the second half of the lesson, they, they were introduced on their uh, iPads to the Japanese method of triangles. It was, uh, baffled me, and it certainly baffled all the children in this primary school class. And so did the long multiplication that were, that were taught in half a lesson. So uh, we learned from going around the world to Shanghai and to Singapore about how maths is taught in those countries. And they, in Shanghai, what's called the math mastery method, they take months to teach long division uh, and long multiplication. They go step by step two digits by two digits ending in a zero. And then they might do something else the following lesson. And when you see those lessons in practice, and we have exemplary lesson, exemplar lessons in this country when we brought this method to England, every child in the classroom got it, as opposed to that school that was in Chiswick, where none of the children would, were understanding what they were, they were being taught. Very few children were taught their multiplication tables uh, at this time before we came into office in 2010. And therefore, secondary schools, they had children starting in year seven who didn't know the tables, broadly speaking, and they were struggling really with basic arithmetic. And secondary schools had to spend a long time helping children to catch up. Shanghai are two years ahead of us, at least in terms of their mathematics at almost every age. So we rewrote the primary math curriculum. We reintroduced uh, to those traditional efficient written methods of calculation we adopted the Singapore 2007 maths primary curriculum, a year-by-year -year detailed curriculum. There was huge opposition to it uh, at the time from the, acad the maths academic, the teaching professors of around the country. And I remember a draft of the curriculum being sent out for informal consultation. And we had the word practice in it, uh, in, the, in the notes and non-statutory guidance to the curriculum. And it had been taken out by, uh, by this process of informal consultation. I put it back in, of course, uh, but it just shows that there's a, yet again in education, there's deep ideological uh, approaches to education, not based on the evidence. All the evidence is that practice does help for children obtain the fluency in mathematics that was necessary. So that primary curriculum was finalized in 2013. It became compulsory in 2014. And the first SATs based on that new curriculum, it was set in 2016. There had been, there was a drop, of course, in the results in the first year of the new SATs, and then it steadily rose uh, uh, the years following that up until, until the pandemic. Um, the, the Shanghai teaching method, I've said, is a step-by-step. -step. It's known as math mastery, and this is a phrase that's banded about at the moment. It means two things. One, it means a deep understanding of the mathematics. Uh, and Shang, uh, Singapore will use very concrete objects, uh, plastic cubes and so on, to, to make sure that that uh, understanding is embedded. And, and Shanghai and Singapore have a very, as I said, a step-by-step -step approach uh, to that, uh, ma ma that, math that mathematics approach. Uh, we also introduced, oh yes, and the second meaning of math, of math mastery is that every child in the classroom will be taught the same curriculum. And I think that is right at primary that we want every child to leave primary school 
fluent in long division, long multiplication, uh, addition, subtraction, and of course, uh, an introduction to algebra and geometry and, and shapes and so on. Um, whereas a non-mastery method is where the, the blue table, they might not cover long division uh, because it's regarded as too demanding. So we wanted to end that to make sure that every child is not only a fluent reader by the time left primary school, but they were also fluent in arithmetic, ready to start uh, secondary school. We introduced the multiplication tables check, as Ian uh, mentioned, um, and this took years to develop, I have to say. We started the process, I think, back in 2012, and it was only really compulsory for the first time uh, uh, last year. Uh, we piloted it, made sure it worked. This is the test of 25 uh, multiplication tables questions. Children have six seconds to answer the question. It's computer-based. Uh, and in that first year, it was compulsory, 27% achieved 100%, and uh, the average mark was 20 correct answers out of 25. And that's the baseline, and we'll see what it is uh, when the results are published uh, this year. And when you go around schools now, and I've visited over 1,000 schools in my time, you do see now that children do, get, do, under, do know their tables, whereas they didn't when I first started uh, visiting schools. And in the TIMS, this is an international survey of the maths of year fives and year nines. The year five children, the 2019 TIMS results, we rose, we, we, our score rose from 546 to 556, a very significant uh, improvement in our uh, international scores for, the, for year fives. Year nine, it's plateaued, and that's something that we now need to address, as we have been for the last uh, few years. So the curriculum review that we conducted from 2011 onwards also reviewed the GCSEs. We made them more demanding, more knowledge rich. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, we, and we did the same for A-level. We were worried that that increase in rigor of the maths GCSE would lead to a drop in numbers taking the A-level maths. But actually, the reverse happened. And as Ian said, maths has been it's the single most popular A-level choice for sixth formers. And it has been for the last uh, eight years. Um, and what happened was that, that young people were better prepared for their maths A-level. And now in the PISA uh, results of the 15-year-olds of taking maths, we've gone up from 26th to 17th place in 28, a score of 493 up to 504. And now we now need to think about uh, what more we need to do to ensure that young people continue to study maths right until the age of 18. We are an outlier. Uh, around the world with just over half of our young people not taking maths uh, at that age, whereas around the world it's commonplace for young people to continue to study some form of maths to 18. That's what the Prime Minister announced uh, very recently. We've set up an expert advisory group and they're looking at two questions. One, what is the maths that someone studying uh, history, English uh, and uh, geography wants to, what should be taking? Uh, and, and so on, what is the math that somebody going on to FE college should be taking, and, and then also how do we make sure that we have the people who are going to teach that mathematics, and the advisory group are working now on both those questions. So that's my uh, introduction, Ian, hope that's okay. Um, I think this is a government, as you know, that takes mathematics very seriously, uh, and personally I've regarded the changes that we've introduced in maths to be as important uh, as the changes we've introduced to the teaching of reading. Over, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for that and for joining us, particularly under the circumstances. Um, as you say, the government has done a tremendous amount on maths over the last 13 years, and I'm looking forward to the PISA results in December, I hope, showing even further improvement on that. Um, next thing to David Thomas. David represents uh, Mesme, who is very kindly sponsoring this event today. And um, David, please let us know your take on this. Yeah, of course. And at the risk of being um, too much of a sycophant, it's really nice as a, as a former maths teacher to have a minister who can go into the detail of what I was doing in the classroom and understand the pros and cons of all, all of those things. And I'm going to start by saying, and, and Nick's covered a bit of this, so England is doing, relatively speaking, um, really very well at maths. Um, we have really improved and transformed the way that maths is taught in our schools over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. And we've seen the fruits of that come through in the international surveys, and, and he talked about those at both primary and secondary age. Um, 
And I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about making a case for why that's not enough and why we should do more. But the thing that gives me confidence that we will be able to achieve that is that we've just seen over the past decade that it is possible to have a really significant national change in education and both what you're doing in the classroom, what you're doing in schools and for that to feed through into results. So I, I'll, be, I'll be moaning about things that I think should be better, but I'll be doing it um, from a sense of knowing that it's possible because of what we've achieved. And my case today is that England is squandering the talent of tens of thousands of children every year and that this is both an individual tragedy and it's a collective one. It's an individual tragedy because, and Ian, you mentioned this, that having maths A-level means that you get about 10% higher earnings than someone doing the same job as you without a maths A-level. And if you make that a maths degree, you're talking about a 30% earnings premium. And that's transformative for an individual and that's huge for social mobility. But it's also a collective tragedy. You know, we have a huge STEM skills gap in this country, and that is holding back our economy. And if we want to be paying for a public sector serving an increasingly aging population, we're going to need the economic growth to be able to support that. And it's more than just about skills gaps, as important though they are. It's also about the types of people that we have into our economy. Mathematicians are inventors, creators, entrepreneurs, innovators, people solving problems, creating opportunities to push society forward. And the more of that we have, the better off we're going to be as a country. And that's not just a conjecture, that's an empirical fact. You know, a, a, one, a one standard deviation increase in school mathematics attainment is associated with an extra two percentage points of GDP growth per annum. And just imagine what an extra two percentage points of GDP growth could do for us when we're talking optimistically about getting 2% over a few years. Adding that on every year would be transformative for our country. So the opportunity here, I think, is real and it is big. And when you look at... 11-year-olds from disadvantaged backgrounds who are top attainers at the end of primary school. There are an awful lot of them. Only half of them make it to getting a good grade at GCSE. Half of them. So we have a tremendous drop-off in talented children who are loving maths, doing well at maths, and, but oh, between the ages of 11 and 16, something goes wrong and they come off that pipeline. And that is 11,000 children in every school cohort. Now, think back to the skills gaps I just talked about. We got some new data out last week about skills gaps, and there are 16,000 STEM specialist skilled vacancies uh, in the English economy. And yet every year, every single school year group, we lose 11,000 children who are on track to be able to fill those. We lose almost enough people to plug the entire economy's skills gaps every single year. Now, just imagine what changing that can do for our economy, what changing that could do for our country. And that's not a crazy beyond reach idea. We're not talking about children who have never liked maths, never been good at it, turning them into geniuses. We are just talking about holding on to the children who are already doing well. So what needs to happen? And um, I think we need to look at the start of secondary school. And I think we need to look at both the classroom experience and the social experience. Now, I do an awful lot of talking to children, particularly talking to 11 and 12 year olds about maths. And they tell me uh, as they move from primary into secondary school, they find maths less challenging and less enjoyable. They come as a pair. They tell me that expectations are often too low and that teachers try and deal with that frustration by making maths kind of superficially fun and removing the intellectual challenge and stimulation that's what they're there for. And they tell me that when they're moving into secondary school, it's a moment when they're deciding who they want to be as an adolescent. They're trying to fit in, they're crafting an identity. And they are frankly worried about making maths part of that identity because of how people will think about them and perceive them. And that's, again, not a hypothetical worry, right? We saw the prime minister uh, pitch maths to 18 to the country in January, and we saw the response that he got. And we have mainstream media outlets putting out headlines like, this is a cult to brainwash our children the idea of studying maths. The, the Telegraph described it as straight out of China's playbook to humiliate our school children. And learning maths at school, right? This, there is no other subject that would get that reaction from mainstream media. And this reaction is causing real and tangible harm to our children. So what do I think this means from a policy perspective? Um, I think there are three messages for us. The first is we should focus on key stage three, on those early years of secondary school. And, and Nick alluded to that in terms of what the TIMS data tells us as well. 
you know, it's very easy and glamorous for people to focus on exam reform and think about GCSEs and so on, but actually the prize is in children as they're a bit younger. Um, secondly, we need to focus on school culture. Schools need our support to create cultures where excellence is prized and where children are proud to be excellent at maths. And thirdly, we do need to challenge this anti-maths attitude, the idea that maths is bad rather than something to be proud of. And so I just want to wrap up really quickly with, with something on, on, on Mesme and my organisation and, and the role of government. And this is traditionally the bit where the person sponsoring the event calls for a large new subsidy um, or for a regulation banning our closest competitors. Um, but fortunately, I'm not going to subject you to any of that. Um, we're already doing this. The brilliance of philanthropy is that we're able to identify a problem and move quickly to solve it. We're working with over 100 schools this year, over 3,000 children. And my sole ask of the room today is to ally with us and support us and row in behind us. We're getting on doing this work. There are schools working with us and making a fantastic difference. But there's lots more that can be achieved. I think this is a problem that, that we need to solve. Uh, it's a problem we can solve it. And we'll be much more successful at solving it with all of your support. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, we can raise the question of a ban on psychology A-level, which is, I believe, maths' <laughs> closest rival at a, another more controversial event. Um, bringing next, um, I'm pleased to bring in Rachel D'Souza. Uh, Rachel is the Children's Commissioner, which means she is the statutory voice of children, as in sense, the voice of children to government, to the nation. Um, and, but prior to that, she was the CEO of one of the most successful academy trusts in the country with an, an incredible track record at taking children from all backgrounds, including some of the most disadvantaged, and uh, really getting absolutely fantastic results out of them, including in maths. And I think we'd love to hear from you from both perspectives, Rachel. Thank you so much. And when I finish, I'm going to leave. And it's not because of anything that's happening in this room. It's because I've got to go to a charities event. So I'm so sorry that I'm going to have to leave. So, I'm going to, I w But I did want to make a few comments first. First off, I think Nick Gibb, I just want to say how amazing he's been on the maths programme. When I started working on maths, probably about 2010-11, um, Elizabeth Truss and I, we went... Um, all around China looking at maths lessons and dreamed up maths hubs and got sort of got things rolling, maths schools. And then when she left as children's minister, Nick took it over and has been absolutely amazing. If he needs knighting for his work on phonics, we need to throw garlands around his neck for the work that is done on mass hubs. He has been absolutely exceptional. And, and I say that as someone who challenges more than, um, you know, and he probably sees me more as someone who challenge him than someone who'd um, sit and say adoring words. So he has been superb. And all those things, I, I, as David said, yeah, I live through. So, you know, once I got back from China, I set up... Um, both an early maths hub and a post-16 math school. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, a math school which is now, now absolutely thriving. Why? Well, what I, what I noticed was on the ground, absolutely what, what we've all been talking about. You know, of, um, I think it was something like 15,000 sixth formers, even more in, in um, Norfolk at the time, fewer than 1,000 did maths and fewer than, I think it was few, 250 did physics. And yet we had the energy industry out on the, you know, out on the coast, desperate for graduates and people working in this area. Now, not there was, you know, the colleges were doing an amazing job, but you know, the definitely in the post sixteen area, we had we had work to do, um, and the math schools have been fabulous. Um, I was down in King's Math School. I've got the privilege of meeting many math schools in just last summer, and met a young girl who was going to Warsaw as our representative, the England's representative, in the Astrophysics Olympiad. And she came back with a gold medal. Now, I bet you didn't read that, um, you know, in your local press. That's absolutely fantastic. And actually, last week, 30 girls in that, in that school were preparing to go to all the different Olympiads. That's amazing and shows how far we've come, you know. And... I can concur totally with the comments about primary curriculum change, how we teach maths, how we're teaching maths at secondary. It's a reality, and really well done to the teachers who have taken this and made it live. So it's brilliant. And in my you know, maths hub, I always had this dream I was going to find a maths genius 
out in King's Lynn that we could like, you know, bring in. And yeah, well, there was just a, just a groundswell of maths being important. And I do remember going on Norfolk Radio telling everyone they had to be tiger moms for maths. It was, you know, we had to get over our kind of maths um, aversion and that it's okay to, be, to not be good at maths. So when I came into, um, came into the role as children's commissioner, I did a big survey called The Big Ask, and we got lots of responses where children talked about education. Interestingly, um, lots of they talked about a range of things, but their education particularly. Lots of them talked to, talked to me about, the, well, the number one thing the half a million respondents told me what that was their biggest dream for the future was a great job or a great career. And that was everything from being, you know, I met green Elon Musk's, we talked to, talked to kids who wanted to be the next prime minister, but we also talked to children who wanted great local jobs in their local areas. They wanted you know, skills, and they knew they needed maths for that, and they were like, support, support, support. What do we need to do? We need maths. And that was a very loud and clear voice. So I looked closely at the maths data, and one of the things that worried me hugely was the low number of girls carry on, carrying on with maths after 16. They were getting great outcomes at 16, but they were not going in the same numbers to our post-16 schools, which is why I mentioned our Olympiad winner, and, and carrying on with maths. And it's still, and physics, and it's still not where it should be. Um, so I've made it a bit of, I always do a project as Children's Commissioner every year on maths. The first one I did, I got Claire Coutinho in her pre-ministerial pre days to be my poster girl for women in maths. And we did a whole project on great jobs using maths. And, and we got, you know, we did profiles, we got it around children, we did research on, you know, uh, particularly on girls with it. And we really are trying, we've done lots of research trying to find out why girls aren't taking it on after 16. Biggest answer, the most, the most significant answer is um, because they don't feel seen and recognised and as confident in those post-16 classrooms. I can't tell you how many girls are t tell me how difficult it is going to phys into physics classrooms and there are no other girls. And we really do have to get behind them and support them. There are great women doing fantastic things, using maths in their careers. And my call is... We've got to support our girls to continue with Maths to 18, um, and indeed all our children. But I think that is a really, really significant in the data. And that's, my, I, I guess, my plea to you today. And I know many of you are doing this, but is we need to get behind our girls. That young lady who, who, who is, you know, beat the entire world in the International Olympiad in astrophysics, she should be up here. You know, we need to be actually celebrating and recognising that and, and all the places and all the skill areas where girls are doing that. So that's my final thought for you. We will not give up on maths. We think it's apps. Children's Commission's Office think it's absolutely critical um, to actually help children meet the ambitions. The final thing I would say, this year I've been asking children around the country, maths to 18, do you want to do it? Right. And we've had such an interesting response. So... An absolute yes in terms of we need we need um, to learn about mortgages. We need to have the maths to be able to cope with our financial lives. We need the maths to cope with the online world and understanding about statistics. When are we being shown fake things? So there was a really strong yes there. There was a pushback on wanting to do A level maths, everyone having to do A level maths to 18. And that pushback, and, and actually, but it wasn't a negative pushback, it was get primary right, get maths right lower down, then we won't have to be doing these things at 16 to 18. And we can actually really focus our post 16 you know, work on the subjects we love. Obviously, everyone in the math schools thought math waiting was a great idea. It hasn't been as universally um, loved in terms of the wider group, but, the, but everybody saw the value of um, maths for their adult lives, for their careers, understanding about how to, how to cope, and particularly financial information. We don't do enough of it. I normally don't give teachers jobs beyond their curriculum because it's, it's, you know, they do an amazing job. But I think in schools we could do more in terms of maths for life. You know, we don't want kids leaving not knowing how to add up the loan, the loan uh, payments on student loans, not understanding credit, um, and um, not understanding mortgages. That's what, that's what they're telling me. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rachel, and thank you very much for coming. I, I know you have to disappear, yeah. and thank Thanks you very much for you. making the time. Very fun. Um, I think Rachel's last point about what do we want in a maths to 18 curriculum, what are the skills after they've got those groundings that the minister talked about, if we get that primary school, that key stage three level correct, what do people need in their adult life is a fascinating, fascinating subject. Financial information, statistics, other things, things which will support them in non-maths related jobs if you need to actually tot up a balance sheet or make sense of some statistics. And I think in many ways this leads us on to our next speaker, Tom Chivers, who is a science writer and journalist. So Tom is one of those people who has been communicating to a largely, or well not largely, but to many, a large audience, many of whom will not be mathematically literate and making numbers make sense. We've just been through a period in the pandemic where suddenly everyone became became interested in things such as R ratings and other things which previously had only occupied science textbooks. And maths was at the heart of a lot of our understanding of the pandemic. And it was in some of the writing that Tom did about this that I first became a fan of his work. So over to you, Tom, to talk a little bit more about that sense of maths more widely in society. Yeah, because um, we've been talking about the importance of maths in people's careers and the skills they have. Uh, but what I wanted to sort of say was... It's actually important for democracy that we're all pretty good at it, right? We all get some sense of it. Because I, I always think of in the, in the mid to late 19th century, there was an expansion of the franchise and people started, you know, the, the more people could vote. And there was this big panic. I remember the, uh, there, was a, there was a politician whose name I will now get wrong, but, uh, uh, Robert Webb, Lord of somewhere, Sherburne or something like that, who, um, who said that, you know, we now think we're going to need to educate. We need to educate people. There isn't enough literacy in the country. People don't. We, people can't. What was it? there was a, there was a phrase he used, which was, "I believe it will be absolutely necessary that you should prevail on our future masters to learn their letters." Basically, you couldn't run a democracy without people able to read the newspapers. Um, and nowadays, I think well, that's still true. But most people can read. That's a good thing, right? Um, but the same is true now for numbers. I think it's most most of the news we consume, or a large amount of it, is numbers related you know crime figures go up and down or um the economy shrinks and grows britain goes up or down in a league table um you know x gallon x million gallons of sewage are pumped into the sea this sort of thing whatever and we need to know we need to be able to investigate those numbers and understand them right um and you know as we've everyone's mentioned here already almost everyone seems to think they're bad at maths this this cannot be true I mean, it simply cannot be true that people are as bad at maths as they think they are. My cousin and I wrote a book together about called, called How to Read Numbers, which is pretty much what it says on the tin, you know, how, how to look at numbers in the news and work out when they're misleading you and so on. And he teaches economics at Durham University, and he says that his students would come along who, to get that place on that course, must have had an A at A level, and most of them thought they were bad at maths. I've I've just written my third book about statistics, and I still can't shake a feeling that I'm pretty bad at maths. Um, you know, it's just, it, it is it is sort of, in, it's in innate in us to do this. But you, you brought up the pandemic. I um, it's, you know, it's a weird thing to say, I guess. But it did sort of give me a lot of hope that people aren't that bad at maths. Because when we had to learn it, when we had to work out what a, an R value was or you know, an exponential curve, then people go, oh, right, suddenly, and suddenly it's being just trotted out on Newsnight without any real introduction. The R value's gone up, and everybody, all oh, right, okay. You know? um, so people can get these concepts, and most of the concepts that we need to navigate demo the sort of de de democracy uh, as it is, most of it is quite graspable when people just explain it in simple terms, I think. You know, most people are numerous and capable of understanding, you know, asking simple questions like, where does that number come from? Is it a big number? Compared to what? You know, uh, um, you know, is there a causal link between, you, know, you say these two numbers go up at the same time, is that causal? For example, you know, people in this room might have mentioned that the, the doing it at maths A level is uh, worth £6,000 in your future earnings. Is that a causal link? Or is, the, is, it, is it just that the sort of person who does maths A level is also the sort of person who tends to get a good job later on? I honestly don't know. I'm genuinely intrigued to ask. Um, you know, and our rankings, you know, when when uh, when a thing goes up and down in the rankings, is that is that is that a big change, like you know, or is, or is it is it is it just that you know, for example, if in, if the UK went goes from fifth to fourth in the world's biggest economies, 
is that a big deal or is it just that there's sort of there's lots of economies about the same size and they shuffle around you know that sort of thing so i guess my conclusion my conclusion my only sort of points i want you to take away from this are that maths yeah is really important it's really important for us as a democracy we can't really function as a democracy unless people have a sort of basic literacy numeracy in this and can sort of understand some sort of so fairly to some of the concepts involved but that people can. They absolutely can. And people think they're bad at maths, but on the whole, they're not. When they actually have to understand something, they can, and they do, and they will work, and they will work it out. And so it is, it, it, it is my job and the job of people like me to explain these concepts as clearly as possible and just talk, you know, when people work out that the R value is not some magic word, but it's just a, a, a term explaining how many people on average are infected by each patient, they can get that. And so it's just our job as journalists, which I don't suppose many of you are, but nonetheless, to explain this sort of thing to people in ways they can understand. And on the whole, they can. And that will make democracy work better and be more functional. And that's my, my only point, really. You don't need to. Thank you, Tom. And I think it's a very, very good point that how can we engage in all the numbers that are thrown around? How can we meaningfully engage in this unless we can understand them? And there will always be people who try and manipulate us with, you know, lies, damned lies and statistics. But can we, can we suss them out? And that's no different. People try and manipulate us with words. To mm. answer your question, it is a causal it's link, at least apparently. Some very clever people, um, uh, Anna Vignoles and others, did some quite complex work looking at people who were identical in every other respect, same GCSE uh. grade, same class, gender, etc., mm. and actually tracked those forward. That's, that's and really so there's some really fascinating stuff on this. Um, I felt bad for is, casting doubt on No, no, it is, um, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been one of the most studied things, but it's mm. brought out we have some of the best databases, the National Pu Pupil Database and the Long-Term Educational Outcomes Database, mm. and when they were matched... Um, actually do, does give you this ability to track some fascinating oh, thank things. thank you. I've learned something. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn to our last um, speaker, um, Leora Cruddus, who is um, Chief Executive of the Confederation of School Trusts, which represents the Academy Trusts in the country. Um, I think we've all been, you know, it's been a little bit of a sort of cheerleading session for maths. We all talk about how important it is, how much it matters. But... Leora's members are the people who, if we're going to teach maths to 18, if we're going to improve the maths teaching that we already have, are actually on the front line of delivering that at a system level and at individual schools up and down the country. So let's, let's sort of come back to earth for a little bit here. And Leora, tell us about the challenges of actually making this happen. Thank you, Ian. So I wanted to speak from an implementation perspective, and I'm going to make four points, and then I, I want to conclude with just a personal reflection. Uh, so I'm going to start by agreeing with the minister that maths is fundamentally important in the early years um, and in primary as a building block for secondary maths. I also agree with the minister that we must follow the evidence. So I'm going to cite the absolutely brilliant work of our EEF. Um, so EEF talks about the importance of maths in early years and, and primary education. So developing a sound um, understanding of math mathematical knowledge when we're young is absolutely essential for future success. Um, it, it is also the case, I think, um, just notwithstanding uh, David's 11,000 children for whom something goes very wrong, it is the case that children's early mathematical knowledge is strongly associated with their, um, with their later school achievement. So EF made a number of, of, of recommendations um, around early years in primary maths, and one was developing teachers' understandings of how children learn maths. Um, secondly, creating dedicated time to learn maths. Thirdly, ensuring that teaching builds on what children already know. And fourthly, using high-quality targeted support to help those children who are starting to fall behind uh, in maths. So I, I guess that, that, that comes to the point of the 11,000. So that's the first point I wanted to make about the importance of early years in primary. Then I wanted to pick up David's point about um, this transition between key stage two and key stage three, so between primary education and secondary education. And again, the EEF can help us thinking about strong implementation. So using assessment to build on pupils' existing knowledge, enabling them to develop very rich mathematical knowledge. 
um, and managing that transition between uh, between primary and secondary. So it's fascinating to hear David talk about uh, children making that transition who talk about maths as being less challenging and less enjoyable. Um, the third point I want to make in terms of implementation is improving the quality of the teaching and supply of maths teachers. That is absolutely essential and we really do have a teacher recruitment and re retention crisis uh, in, in England at the moment. Um, and some, some of that recruitment and retention crisis is in the so-called STEM um, uh, subjects. So excellent maths teaching requires really sound, um, really good content knowledge, but actually this is not really sufficient because excellent teachers also know the way in which pupils learn maths and the difficulties that they're likely to encounter. So in other words, how maths can be effectively taught. Um, my fourth and final point before I make a personal, uh, just tell a personal story, is what I've called seeing the tapestry, not just the thread. So we need to build coherent education policy in England. And this is not just about pulling one thread. It's not just about pulling the lever of maths to 18. It's about creating a tapestry of excellence within our education system. And that feels very important to me, that notion of, of coherence and curriculum coherence. Um, then finally, uh, and, and this is the, the, the personal point, we've heard a lot today about the importance of maths for our economic prosperity and, and for our democracy. I want to make the case that education is a good in itself. And while it is important that we think about what schooling contributes to our economic prosperity or to our democracy, I think it's really fundamental that we accept that education is a good in itself and that we need to put the richness of knowledge rich back at the centre of curriculum. So I'm not a maths teacher, I'm an English teacher, uh, and I have a particular love of poetry. So I want to conclude just with a quote from Einstein. Pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. Thank you, Leo, and thank you to all our panellists. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will come to questions in the floor momentarily, but I'd like to just sort of use chair's privilege to um, put one question to our, to our minister, um, Nick Gibb, if I may. And this one is around um, the supply of maths teachers, because I think we all know that you know, maths teaching, we've put a lot of money into it in terms of bursaries and you know, um, golden hellos, but ultimately a maths graduate will always be able to work in the financial services sector, in engineering, in all the other areas which David no, would no doubt tell us is contributing to our prosperity. And therefore, we have to make maths an attractive profession in its own right. In terms of w both what the government is doing, but where he thinks there is the most potential to bring some of those talented maths graduates into our schools, to particularly to support around the push to 18. I'd like to ask the minister where he thinks and he hopes we will be focusing in the future on that one, beyond the simple question of money. I mean, it's a very good question, and it is key to what we're seeking to, that our ambition for maths to 18. People often cite statistics that say that 12% of lessons in maths are taught by somebody who doesn't have a post level qualification in mathematics. This is true. It's about 88% do. That figure of 88% is higher now than it was in 2014. It's gone up every year since then. And although there's a change of methodology in 2014, so I have to say that as a minister, it's uh, higher than it was in 2010. So um, it's, a, it's been a challenge for a long time, and it's been a challenge prior to 2010 as well. Um, and um, one of the things we've asked the expert panel to look at is to find imaginative ways that we can fill that gap, that I mean, an increasing gap that will come if we want to have uh, mass for all young people up to the age of 18. We've introduced a levelling up premium, so this is an extra uh, £3,000 a year tax-free for maths teachers and physics and computing teachers as well, um, in the, who are in the first five of the, uh, years of their career, uh, if they teach in a disadvantaged a school serving a disadvantaged community or in the um, education investment areas as well. So there are, there are policies like that that uh, we want to uh, continue to or maybe enhance. 
in order to encourage more people to come and to teach in, in maths education. But it's key, it's a key question to ask. And it's something that we are absolutely addressing. And so is our expert advisory group. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. It's very, very heartening to hear the expert advisory group is looking at that. And you're right to point out the progress that has been made. Um, could I pass it open to questions from the floor? And if I could ask, when you ask your question, if you could just very briefly say your name, your organisation or local association, and to keep the question brief, please. So questions rather than statements. And the lady just there, please. I'll take three at a time. Um, Corrie M.P. is good president of the Association of Colleges. I think the panel have made the point really well about the importance of maths for our country for growth and prosperity and the importance for individuals of maths A-level and the advantages that you can get. But I really want to draw our attention to the tens of thousands of young people who drop off that cliff edge age 16 without a good grade um, in GCSE maths and who have so many doors closed to them um, whether it's T-levels or apprenticeships in some of our really sector areas that are crying out for the talent. I'd love the Key Stage 3 project to come to fruition so we don't have as many of those young people. But in the short to medium term, what can we do to prevent those doors being closed? Thank you. And um, if I could also just take the gentleman just to the front um, there as well. Thank you. And thank you all for a really interesting discussion. Uh, George Sadler from the Royal Society. Um, we recently uh, produced a, a new paper um, on a new approach to mathematics and edu data education, which would fuse uh, mathematics, statistics, data science, uh, and computer science. Uh, and part of that paper talks uh, really positively about core maths qualifications, but I think it's uh, around 2% of 18-year-olds uh, that are taking it. So um, to what extent could uh, ensuring core maths is offered uh, across the country support some of the uh, ambitions that we've talked about today? Brilliant, thank you. And uh, one more question. Um, the lady at the front. Just Hi, uh, uh, my name's Matilda Martin. I'm a reporter with TAS. Um, I just wanted to ask, obviously, the expert reports now with number 10 and um, the Department for Education. Um, what are the next steps now and when can we expect to hear on decisions um, regarding that? Um, and I was also wondering, with the recent news around Rishi Sunak's British Baccalaureate plan, whether this is expected to proceed separately or together with that? Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask each of the panel just to basically pick one of the questions that catch, caught their fancy and to answer it. So, um, Leora, starting with you. Um, perhaps if I could speak to uh, the point that the president of the Association of Colleges made. I think there's a load of more work that we need to do uh, to stop doors closing in children's faces for all sorts of reasons. And I, I think maths is, is one of them. I don't think that there are silver bullets, really, in education policy. I think there are really silver bullets in education policy. So I think we do need to build uh, mathematical knowledge over time in, 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 in the way that I suggested. And I know that your members will be doing absolutely brilliant work with young people who would otherwise have doors closed uh, to, to enable those doors to, to, to stay open. The work of further education in this space is absolutely essential. Thank you. And um, David, what does your organisation think about core maths? Yeah, right. So um, I, I'm a big fan of core maths, so um, thanks for the question. Um, and core maths, if doesn't know, it's an AS level sized qualification um, at level three that's, that's about mathematics. And um, so I think core maths is great. And core maths was designed to try and solve some of this problem, right? Of people who didn't want to do A level maths, but for whom it was good to do some kind of quantitative study post 16. Um, what, what I would say about core maths is I think core maths is a great example of trying to do a broader set of mathematics than people often think of when they think of maths, do some of the data science and so on, but doing it really rigorously. I think one of the problems that we see in Key Stage 3, and you know, I'm going to flip the question back to Key Stage 3 rather than Post-16 a little bit, one of the problems that we see is people or teachers see children who are frustrated, disengaged, not enjoying it, and then they try and flip to make it kind of engaging and interesting in an incredibly superficial way that doesn't then intellectually stimulate children, then they don't enjoy it, and then that feeds into the frustration. Core Maths, I think, is a great example of showing that you can design a qualification in a curriculum that is doing a bunch of broader stuff that people say they're interested in and say they want to learn about, whilst also doing it in an incredibly intellectually stimulating way. So I think there's a lot for us to learn from Core Maths. Of course, the thing that we need to learn um, 
is you know, why hasn't it had bigger take up? Um, but that's something that I think ties into some of these post 16 and, and maths to 18 and British back uh, uh, com conversations that I think someone else is going to talk about. Tom. Oh, God, I'm so out of my depth on the policy stuff, but let's give it a try anyway, shall we? Um, okay, so on, on the subject of drop-offs at 16, I mean, I, I worry so much when I, if I start saying we should do more of the thing that I'm interested in because that always means doing less of the other things that other people are interested in. But from just speaking from the sort of stuff that I think is, from the stuff I was talking about earlier on about the importance for democracy and so on, I do think that the, the statistics... Are, are, this, are sort of subject that are dear to my heart and just sort of helping people understand things like probability and things like, um, uh, you know, how, how determining whether something is a large number and all the things I talk about. So I, I, my, my completely unevidenced uh, guess would be if you show these people, show, show young people these, are, these things are important for the world and it's not just a sort of intellectual game, that would be a nice way of, of, um, uh, of, of pushing them forward. However... I'm really nervous that this is already done in huge amounts and that teachers know perfectly well what they're doing, so I don't want to be too prescriptive on any of this. Thank you. And um, to the Minister, um, we will ask you if there's anything you can say about the question regarding the expert report and the uh, British Baccalaureate, but also um, please do feel free to uh, comment on any of the other questions as well. Yes, I mean, I don't have much to say on, on those two things. Uh, the expert panel, you know, we, this isn't a short-term fix in terms of maths to 18 it will take uh time um uh but will but the report you know the the advice of the expert panel will uh should be uh coming to us very soon on the issue of i'm particularly interested in the question about from the association of colleges because <clears throat> i get criticized the government gets criticized for the thing called the condition of funding so any course in fe now uh if, if the student taking the course doesn't have a good pass, i.e. a grade four or above in GCSE, maths uh, and or English, they have to continue the study and, be, and being taught those subjects as a condition of the college getting the funding for that course. And the pass rates of those young people that don't have a, f a grade four or above isn't, isn't as high as it should be, the retake pass rate. However, the, the pass rate is increasing as the FE colleges are getting better at teaching these subjects. And about 70,000 19-year-olds now, uh, more a year, have a, a GCSE at four or above in maths uh, and English as a consequence of this policy. And their lives will be transformed, as we know, as we've heard earlier, by having those qualifications. So I think it's a great policy. I am very optimistic about, actually, about more and more young people being able to get a grade four or above. It's not it. Our uh, GCSEs, oh, by the way, one to threes are still passes at GCSE, um, uh, level one passes, level two is grade four and above, and that's why we call a grade four a, a good pass. But actually, there's nothing to stop 100% uh, getting grade four or above. Our system is not norm referenced, it's criteria referenced. And what we saw just before the pandemic is the we have this thing called a national reference test at Ofqual. Uh, uh, introduce uh, 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 conducts that uses the same questions and is able to see whether in the system as a whole standards are rising and that enables them then to have a different proportion of uh, of uh, of young people at each grade because there's a, been a genuine increase in the standard across the system and um, before the pandemic that national reference test was showing some very significant increases and that some of that's been lost by the pandemic, so we are the, the, the grading isn't changing. But it does show that actually, with all the reforms that we put into place, and the maths hubs extending from primary now, you know, the, the, the maths mastery approach coming into secondary, I'm optimistic that in the long run, we'll, we'll, we will have a significantly higher proportion achieving four above in maths GCSE than before. Thank you, and um, thank you for mentioning the National Reference Test, which is my favourite little-known reform in our education sector. It is genuinely brilliant that we have a way of testing whether or not we are actually getting better as a nation, unlike the period throughout the sort of 90s and noughties where it was basically up to whoever was the education secretary to um, make the passes rates go up every year, uh, despite the skills of the nation not. Um, I think we have one round for one more round of three questions, if people have them. We'll go to the um, gentleman at the back there. 
Uh, hi, Ben Gadsby. Um, by day, I am at the charity Impetus, and by night, Thurrock Conservatives. Uh, I'm also one of the few people that's probably willing to say I'm pro-condition of funding, so please keep that up, Minister. It feels to me that across what we've talked about so far, Key Stage 3, primary, the resits problem, a big part of the solution here should probably be tutoring, uh, and I wondered if the panel could tell us their view on where they think tutoring should be in the system in five years' time and the steps we need to take to get there. Thank you. Um, the lady just uh, there. Hi, it's Katie Watts from Money Saving Expert. Um, obviously, I agree that maths is brilliant for filling our skills and careers gaps, but also for social equity and financial stability in future of every citizen. And actually, as it goes, I agree with uh, Tom as well that it's important for democracy, for example, looking at this policy about inheritance tax and who that actually impacts. Um, but unfortunately, um, the incentives for delivering financial education are still quite low. And the minister will remember our founder, Martin Lewis, um, championing it into the financial um, curriculum through PSHE and maths. But there were GCSE and A-level equivalent courses which have now been withdrawn. They're now no longer commercially viable um, due to post-16 reforms and due to instability around the points that are offered for the Sorry, schools and colleges. Sorry, could I ask you to um, make your question concise, if that's okay? Sure. Uh, my question is, what can the government and policy do to incentivize providers to be able to deliver those courses and schools to be able to offer them? Fantastic. Thank you. And we'll go to the gentleman just over there. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ed Marsh. I'm the Chief Executive of an organisation called the Tutor Trust, so also a big fan of tutoring. Um, but my, my specific question actually is about attainment gaps, um, and there's a north-south question in that. So London, I think, has mid-70s in terms of grade four and above. I think here in Manchester, it's the low 60s. But also within those stats, there's a real attainment gap between pupils on the pupil, pupil premium and those not. And that's much worse in the north of England than it is in the south of England. So schools in the north perform less well and the gap within them is worse. That's obviously a problem. And so I just wonder if the panel could speculate about why that problem exists and what can we do about it? Fantastic. Thank you. Three great questions there on tutoring, on financial literacy and on the attainment gap, particularly in the north. Um, we'll go to the in reverse order this time. So that was going to you first, Minister. Super. Uh, well, tutoring, um, I, I obviously I'm a great fan of tutoring. We, we brought in the National Tutoring Programme during COVID and recovering from COVID um, in order to particularly help those children who had fallen furthest behind, and particularly children from disadvantaged backgrounds. We have an ambition that the that tutoring will continue way beyond uh, the pandemic. And because it's our view that a lot of, you know, more prosperous families routinely use tu private tutors to help their child with French or math or whatever they might be weak in. And th this isn't something that the more disadvantaged families can afford or generally do. So we were trying to establish a market, proper market for tutoring to become a routine as part of uh, the tool that schools use to help children catch up and also to help close that attainment gap uh, that the chap from the tutor trust was, was talking about. Um, and the, we are encouraging schools to use their pupil premium to help continue that process, even after we, uh, the, you know, we've, we have a subsidy of 50% now for, for co schools' costs in doing this. But, well, you know, in the longer term, if that isn't sustainable in the longer term, uh, that, that, that it will be part of the tools that, that schools use to spend their pupil premium on. Um, in, in the future. So I'm very excited by that because we know from all the evidence that it absolutely is one of the most effective ways of helping children to catch up with their peers. Um, money saving expert, Katie, um, I work with Martin Lewis very, very closely. It is compulsory, by the way, in financial education, it's in maths and it's in citizenship. Uh, so the people that have been arguing for it have won, uh, it's there. Uh, it's not easy for teachers to teach. You can teach interest rates, you can teach all the mathematics of financial education because that's what they're, they've been trained to teach. The, the understanding the regulations about pensions, uh, the lifetime allowance, the annual allowance, learning about uh, how income tax is calculated with the, with the personal allowance and the different rates and different... This is more challenging for any teacher. And so it was wonderful that Martin Lewis produced for us a textbook setting out these 
this knowledge that uh, uh, that uh, children should be taught. And we have the National Oak uh, Academy, uh, which uh, at some point, no doubt, will be trying to help teachers teach this subject. Um, and then uh, the attainment gap around the country. I mean, this is absolutely everything that this government has been. Uh, it's, it's the root of all our education reforms since 2010, closing that attainment gap. And I'm proud of what's been achieved in London. Um, and we have been closing the gap until the pandemic right across the country um, by 13% in primary and by 9% in secondary. And um, that has been blown away by the pandemic. But I'm confident that we will see that close again swiftly because the reforms, of course, that led to that close are still in place. Um, and there are challenges coming out of the pandemic, and that's what the five billion pounds on tutoring is all about and all the other recovery programs that we've introduced. Um, but everything we're doing, so we need to, uh, all the programs, all the, all the different curriculum hubs. We have English hubs helping to spread best practice in the teaching of phonics and the love of reading. We have maths hubs, as we've heard, spreading best practice in the teaching of mathematics. There are now coming up to 40 of these math hubs around the country spreading best practice. We have the behavior hubs program spreading best practice about improving behavior. Uh, and that is key to any improvement in maths uh, or any academic subject at school. We have the foreign language hubs, again, improving the teaching of uh, foreign languages as well uh, in school. So that's really what those programs are all about. But it is everything this government is about is about closing that attainment gap throughout throughout England. Thank you. Um, Tom, could I maybe address the question on financial literacy to you? And what do you think um, would help people coming out at 18 in that particular area? Oh, God. Well, so I will say one thing. We're trying to dealing with sort of uh, having to figure out things like stamp duty at the moment because we're trying to buy a house. And so if some, some sort of financial education would be really helpful at this point. Um, so, basically, the um, the problem that the ki kids are going to ha have is, you know what? I don't know. I don't know how the kids are gonna, how much how much use this is going to be because the the problem kids have is that you, when, when you're thrown out into the world, you have an awful lot of big numbers you have to deal with, and I, uh, the idea of the a, 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 a set of school lessons will immediately solve those problems seems to me very complicated. I'd be lo I would love to know if there's good evidence that they can. Um, I don't know if there is. I think the uh, problem, you know what? I don't know. I don't have a good answer to this question. I'm, not, I'm just waffling and I'm going to stop. <laughs> That's really welcome to have a panelist <laughs> say that. And perhaps yeah. all of us there should do Sorry, that. Sorry, I just it I could hear myself there. just saying nothing <laughs> at all. So I thought I will stop. It does strike me actually though, um, hearing on what you're saying on mm. this is actually, is this something which actually our association of colleges mm. um, and so forth, adult education on this? Because often, mm. you know, how interested are you going to be in pensions or on mortgages when you're 17? And actually being able to dial into those sorts of things. We have lessons, we have colleges, we have remote learning, which can be done mm. more. But would you think to go to look at it? I don't know. That's, Again, I mean, but that's there's a, a very interesting question of actually we have a whole education suite of institutions throughout our country, not just schools, yeah. and people need different things. At different I just imagine my children, who are not at that age yet, but the idea that you could interest them in that seems unlikely to me. But they, they're, they're young, they're still only nine and seven, maybe by the time they're 16 and 17, and then the amount of money they'll lose in, in taxes will be important <laughs> to them. But at the moment, I, I just feel you're gonna be fighting an uphill battle with that quite a lot of the time. Sorry, that was a lot of waffle, and I apologize for not having the first clue in answer to your question. Thank you, and we are overrunning, I'm afraid, so I'm going to go ask David and Leora mm. to be quite brief, and completely my fault as chair for overrunning, but David, just last remarks on those questions. Yeah, I, I, cool, I'll be brief. Um, tutoring, I think tutoring has clearly got a role to play in a system. If you think about 11,000 kids being lost from every school cohort, that's going to be for a mixture of reasons. I think the baseline we need to do is improve the school experience and tackle the social issues that I talked about. I think that'll deal with a bunch of them. But there are going to be kids who fall off because they have a spell in hospital, they move between schools and miss out on a chunk of curriculum. There are all sorts of other reasons. And that tutoring has got to be part of the toolkit, I think, to be able to help some of those kids, those kids catch up. So that's, that's clearly there. And um, I'll take the attainment gap question as well. Like, this is a deep and complex problem, right? This isn't just a mass problem, and this isn't just a, this isn't just a new problem. I've worked in uh, uh, schools in London, I've worked in schools in Norfolk, and it's like completely different. And 
if you are working in a school in some of these places where you have bigger attainment gaps, that's because it's harder to recruit good staff, there is less proximity to opportunity, like the funding nationally isn't balanced in the way that you might want it to be, there are all sorts of these things. What I would say is they are not inevitably leading to that, those bigger gaps. There are plenty of schools all across the country who really do it, who do a fantastic job of showing what is possible, who challenge those narratives, and they show that their children can achieve just as well as children anywhere else, and their gaps aren't there. So what we need to do is learn from those schools that are doing that, champion them, celebrate their successes, and spread it across all of the others. Brilliant. Thank you, David. And um, that leaves you, Leora, to have the final word. So I'm going to also speak to you the point about attainment gaps uh, and just to agree with David that it's a complex problem. I'm not going to say the things that he said. I'll say three other things. The impact of the pandemic, as the minister said, the effect of poverty, uh, which uh, uh, you know needs a cross-government strategy, and then the wider social issues and trends that we're seeing, uh, for example, the issues around um, school attendance. So what, is the, what, what are the solutions? The solutions are to follow the evidence. And uh, I think tutoring is one um, very well-established evidence-based intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to ask us all to say a big thank you to our minister, our sponsor, and all of our panelists in the normal way. Thank you very much. Thank you.